beautiful, beautiful, really, really magical. Um, so welcome back to all of you joining us from the planetaria, the museums, the theaters across the country, and a fresh hello to those of you who have just come online live via cosmosontv.com, live stream, the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences website, and our other online partners. Uh, I was keeping track and Cosmos Live was uh, trending during the uh, presentation, so that's very exciting. And now we've got all these new people. We don't need Ellen DeGeneres or Meryl Streep. We can break Twitter if we all work together. Um, for those of you who weren't with us earlier, I'm Joe Early from Fox. I am your host this evening, and we are coming to you live from the Cosmos Pavilion at the Griffith Observatory in Los Angeles. Now, before we start with the Q&A, for, for those people who have just come online to join us, we are going to take one more quick look at Cosmos. Enjoy. This is the Cosmos on the grandest scale we know network of a hundred billion galaxies. The origin of life is one of the greatest unsolved mysteries of science. Come with me. Our journey is just beginning. We have only just opened our eyes. Cosmos premieres Sunday at 9 on these Fox and National Geographic networks. That was just a taste of what Cosmos delivers. Rich, epic storytelling combined with stunning, jaw-dropping visuals. It is a truly meaningful project about space, nature, life, and humanity, and we are all so proud to be a part of this incredible project. We have a great night ahead of us, so we're going to get started. And if you're gonna help me welcome out our uh, amazing Cosmos team. First, we have world-renowned astrophysicist and author, recipient of the NASA Distinguished Public Service Medal and director of the Hayden Planetarium, our incredible host, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Thank you, Bob. Hello. Can I sit here? Okay. There's nothing like hosting next to the host. Uh, <laughs> next up, an award-winning writer, producer, and best-selling author who has dedicated her life to the cosmos and even has an asteroid named after her. Please welcome back our brilliant writer, executive producer, director, Annie Dream. Excuse me, I'll, I'll go up first. <laughs> Uh, next up, a genius, we could just say genius, really. Writer, director, actor, singer, host, philanthropist, and self-proclaimed science buff, Cosmos executive producer, Mr. Seth McFarland. <laughs> next up is uh, Cosmos studio president and executive producer who partnered with Annie seven years ago to bring a new Cosmos to worldwide television. Mitchell Cannell. Next up is Emmy Award nominated director and our executive producer and director of Cosmos, Brandon Braga. And finally, our show's tireless co EP, the man on the ground who helped keep all of the stars aligned, Jason Clark. Okay, so if you are watching online and you would like to submit a question, please just tweet it with the hashtag Cosmos Live. That will also help us trend again. Um, but we're gonna jump right in and actually kick things off with a question from Facebook. It's a fan named Edward Flick. And here is his question. What knowledge are you most excited to bring to the public in an easily digestible form such as Cosmos? So let's, uh, first it assumes it is easily digestible, uh, but what are you most excited to bring to the public in this form? Yeah, I, that question presupposes that Cosmos is a delivery vehicle for science knowledge. <laughs> While we do some of that, I don't think that's what's most memorable about it. So if you ask, what do I think is sort of the most significant aspect of science that it communicates, it's the fact that science, the universe, Nature is not only knowable, but how we have come to learn how it works has become a fundamental part, has been folded into our 
civilization, into how we live our lives. And the significance of that connection, I think people often take for granted. They say to themselves, I don't need science, I got my this other thing that I'm doing. When science is all around us and it, we confront major issues going forward in the 21st century about energy and health and security and, and the solutions to those problems are derived from investments and innovations in science and technology. So for me, I, I, there might be some other answers here, but for me, Cosmos' biggest scientific message is that science is all around us and science can be not only in your mind, but in your heart. And, and you uh, have a specialty. I mean, you're sort of a rock star scientist. Uh, and I think we all, we all benefit from that because you have a specialty of making things understandable for the layperson. And I know, I know that's one of the reasons why you're such an amazing um, participant in this project. But and I know that's one of the reasons that you, you connected with Seth and why you thought Fox was a good home for it, which I think actually sort of ties into this. So why did you think it was important to have it be somewhere like Fox and National Geographic? Okay. Well, uh, first of all, it was Neil who introduced me to Seth, for which I will be eternally grateful. And um, when, you know, when Carl Sagan was alive and we were working together, we weren't trying to reach the people who read the New York Review of Books. We wanted to reach everyone because we believed that this knowledge is a birthright. It belongs to all of us. You want to reach the Kardashians. <laughs> That's what everyone, you want every single person. And so, and so when Seth uh, proposed that we take Cosmos to Fox, which, you know, for a moment it was a bit of a head snap. But then it was like, wow, that's brilliant. You really are a genius. That is brilliant because that's who we want to reach. And then when National Geographic joined with Fox to make this the largest rollout in the history of a television series, this was a great fulfillment of a dream, really. And uh, I can't imagine a better place. I've got to tell you that Mitchell Kennold and I uh, started out on this road seven years ago went to the usual suspect networks that uh, would probably want a science-based uh, series. And um, it was really interesting to both of us that while everybody wanted Cosmos, they knew it was kind of a unique form of science-based entertainment, that, um, that they, they wanted to control it. They wanted to be able to edit out the uncomfortable parts. And I, I said no. And I am so glad I did, because, because then Seth brought us to Fox and National Geographic. And in the four years that we've been working together, that has never once been an issue. And I'm so thrilled to have the freedom to make the cosmos that we hope will be worthy of the original. Fox specializes in discomfort. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> right? Well, you know, we've, we've actually discussed the head snap was happening on both sides because there were many of us at Fox that were saying, Cosmos on Fox? No, you know, how are we going to do that? Those of us who've had the, the pleasure of being a part of the project have been, you know, absolutely uh, impressed and overwhelmed uh, along the way. And I think, Seth, I'm sure part of, of sort of your checklist of things were that the show would have to stand on its, on its own as being entertaining. And, and the use of animation and the use of amazing, amazing visual effects. And I'm just wondering, from the beginning, did you sort of have, have any sort of um, guidelines along the way of science versus entertainment? Well, I mean, the only guidelines that were self-imposed were the ones that applied to the original Cosmos. And, and you know, one of my favorite quotes I'm, I'm not going to remember this correctly, but I'll paraphrase from Carl when the original Cosmos came out, was that I, I want this to be interesting to people who have no pre-existing interest in science and are going to watch just for the spectacle. And, and that was what we wanted to preserve, this, the, 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 the idea that this was certainly educational and inspiring, but that it would have a, a certain... P.T. Barnum element as well, which the original Cosmos had in, 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 in an immense way. I mean, it was, it, was, it was, particularly for 1980, it was an extraordinarily diverse, visually diverse array of, of, uh, of images. And 
Um, it, he worked on he worked on it. <laughs> and here, you know, did you really it, work on it? <laughs> I, don't, I mean, the, 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 the idea was was I mean, the, the, there are two people who don't get recognized enough, and they're they're I'm going to indulge myself. They're probably here. Uh, our, our animated sequences that were supervised by Cara Vallo. I don't know if she's here. And, and obviously our, our music by the, by the brilliant Alan wow. Silvestri, who is here somewhere. And it's like, you know, these, are, these, are, these are folks who were instrumental in, in helping to make this feel like a Hollywood spectacle, which, which is really, there has to be some streak of that in, in, in this sort of production. Yeah, and I have to butt in. You said science versus entertainment. I'm entertained by the universe every day I think about it. So I, what do you mean versus? I, when I think about falling into a black hole, that's hilarious what happens to you, right? That is entertaining. If it's, if it's on Family Guy. <laughs> no, no, really. so, so the, the concept that it's one versus the other and you have to strike some balance, I think the universe, uh, and by the way, I, we can use the f term entertaining on many levels. Something could be entertaining because it's inspiring. It's, it's reaching you on many dimensions. And, and so I, didn't, I never once was thinking we have to drop one to get the other. It's the merging of the two, which if you invest some thought into it, becomes a very natural marriage of those two, those two ideas and those two places to go. And, and certainly the, the, the teachers that you remember the most from your education are the ones who are the most entertaining and the ones who are able to communicate their own enthusiasm for the material. And Neil does that brilliantly. I mean, I, if, if you sit down to lunch with Neil, which I've had the pleasure of doing, it, you just find you're five years old again and you're just asking him questions. And I, I wanna know about this and I wanna know about this. And by, by the end of the lunch, you're like, are you, are you Jesus? And, <laughs> and, <laughs> And, and, you know, our, our hope is that this show will, will kind of have that effect, that, like, it's, it's the world's greatest teacher that you remember for your whole life. One of the lunches we had together, he's asking me 30 questions about the Big Bang. And it was, I thought it was a little odd, but that's fine. Right. I hook and in up. the meantime, you ate all my fries. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and a few months later, there's a whole episode of Family Guy where Stewie and his ah. time machine go back to the Big Bang. <laughs> And at the end, it's like science consultant Neil deGrasse Tyson. I, I was like, lunch buddy Neil deGrasse Tyson. What that was. Look, he we're actually, just we're just trying to legitimize yeah. ourselves, all right? <laughs> he you asked about, that lunch twice. <laughs> you, Joe, you um, asked. Okay, we're, you asked about Seth's contribution and his humility. He certainly was respectful of what Carl and Ann and Steve Soder created in the original. But on the other hand, he so improved upon the model in some major significant ways. It was his thought to bring the ship of the imagination into every episode, which really provides the viewer, as they'll see in subsequent episodes, a real journey that, that's really spectacular throughout the entire series. And second, as in the original, there were actors, uh, a lot of the Bruno sequence we just saw, um, in the stories that were told in the original series. And it was Seth's suggestion, instead, that they should be animators, led by Caravallo and the, the phenomenal group of his team, that really uh, created a whole new way of storytelling, a new vocabulary for, for telling stories that we hope the audience will find really captivating. And so uh, this, is, this man is the gift that keeps on giving. Um, he brought Alan Silvestri to the group as well, and, and, uh, and all of this. Braga. And Brandon Braga. Brandon <laughs> and Jason, Jason Clark. Clark. And so uh, what, what we started with, um, he has made so much bigger. So much and, and made the dream uh, exponentially greater. Great. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Okay. Now we're going to go to our first question off the stage. We are going to the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. <laughs> My name is Steve Carey from Rhinebeck, New York, representing the Red Hudson Astronomical Association. My question, Neil, is I read lately that Stephen Hawkins is backing off on the black hole theory. What's your take on where he's going with it? Yeah, every time Stephen Hawking utters anything, the press comes to me in the United States to comment <laughs> on it. I feel like, oh, Steve, can you give me like a six month break or something? <laughs> so uh, his idea is that a black hole, what we think of as the boundary between this universe and that one inside of a black hole separated by the event horizon, beyond which no light escapes, he's rethinking that event horizon concept as this sort of turbulent royal, as I understand his paper, this turbulent roiling quantum surface and if you're a quantum surface, then light can pop in and out of it. And so that a black hole would not really be black. It would be like gray. But it's still a thing you want to avoid. That's where, <laughs> really where I'm. 
ending. Well, it's, we have a whole episode takeaway. about black holes. Yeah. So that could be a little bit of a problem. If he's well, it takes gray in it, I think. Right? No. <laughs> Show it in the light room. All right, now we're going to go to uh, National Geographic Society's Groves Noor Auditorium in Washington, D.C. Hi, Ann. Andres Almeida from Washington, D.C. 35 years ago, Cosmos, a personal voyage, debuted, and it created a lasting impact on our culture. What do you hope the legacy will be of Cosmos, a space odyssey, will be 35 years from now? Thank you so much for that wonderful question. Right in the sweet spot. Um, I very much hope that the world will see Cosmos and be, appreciate the power of the scientific perspective. And in my wildest dreams, Cosmos awakens us from our stupor. We take the ideas in cosmos, that the, uh, the revelations of science, to our hearts and act accordingly to preserve and protect this tiny world. When you, when you see the pale blue dot, when you can step back from the distance of Neptune and look at your home, it's a transforming experience. I know that people say that, you know, science is one thing and spirituality is something else or politics or any of those other things. I believe that. But I also believe that you can't take in what science is telling us about global warming, about the fragility of our home, about the ancient continuity of which we are a part without feeling some sense of responsibility to preserve it and to pass it on to the next generation. And if, if, if Cosmos were to inspire those feelings in enough people around the planet, then I can't imagine how gratifying that would be. <laughs> Okay, now we're going to move on to the James S. McDonald Planetarium at the St. Louis Science Center. Hi, my name's Matt, and this question is for Seth McFarlane. Have you always been interested in science? And who are some of your uh, favorite science heroes? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I have always been interested in science. I, I remember seeing the original Cosmos as a child and and as an adolescent and as an adult. I've, I've seen it a number of times and uh, you know gosh my, my favorite scientists um, uh, got the Reverend Donald Wildman <laughs> sorry um, obviously Carl Sagan uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson of course um, I, you know Richard Feynman is a guy who I, I I yeah. enjoy reading yeah. very much. Um, you know, the, the people who are who are able to. You know, I don't know anything about mathematics. I was a terrible math student, and so people who can, who are able to translate the language of quantum physics, the language of mathematics, into uh, a, 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 a form that I can process and appreciate and and experience wonder over. Those are again. Those are the the the, the teachers that, that I respond to, and and uh, you know, and, and one of the reasons we, you know, we all love Neil so much is that he's a guy who has that gift. He's a guy who can take a, a mathematically complex premise and explain it to you in a way that is accessible and communicates his own enthusiasm and eat all your fries in the process. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't be holding that over your head. Just, <laughs> it happened once. And they were good fries. <laughs> I think I've heard both um, Seth and Neil talk about inspiring young people, you know, with the program uh, along those lines of sort of awakening in, in people and understanding that there are careers in these fields that they didn't know about. I, I, first of all, I don't think kids need any inspiration at all to have wonder about the natural world around them or to, to discover. That's all they do. If you let them, all right, if you let them run loose in your yard, 
that's the end of your yard, but they would have been <laughs> totally e exploratory under the rock, the bark of the tree, the leaves. In your home, they'll break stuff, but these are experiments. And uh, so I'm not worried about, I'm worried about scientifically illiterate adults. They run the world, they wield resources. They're, they're in charge and they outnumber the kids. So, so the kids will see cognitive, yeah, yeah, I love that, yeah, we, we all knew our, it's the adults, that I, it's everybody, yes. But the issue in modern time is, do adults have the wisdom and insight brought to you by a scientific perspective to actually lead this world into the future? Because it doesn't matter what you do with the kids, the adults who are in charge don't have it, you are throwing seeds to fallow ground. All right. Don't get me started. I think I did. Uh, here's a question from Twitter. It comes from at Kobe Cobb. And uh, this is an interesting one. Do you think time is slowing down? As in, is the universe really expanding faster or has time slowed down since the Big Bang? I keep trying to figure out how to get more time in my day. <laughs> Easy question. Okay, so, sure. no, so uh, these are very interesting questions and there's a sub, there's a cottage industry in physics and astrophysics where we ask, are things the same between now and the past, or have they somehow changed to make it, to fool us into thinking, thinking that something has changed? It turns out what an atom does with the electron in the nucleus, when, atom, when electrons change energy levels, when they spin, when they do these quantum things, we can measure exactly the same phenomena in atoms across the galaxy as we can here. And there's something called the fine structure constant. It is a constant of nature, hardly ever gets out to the public. But it is one of the greatest measures of the constancy of the universe, not only across space, but through the depths of time. So in fact, the constants of nature, as we have come to query them, and as they have come to respond to us, have been the same throughout space time. So that's a no. That's, oh, sorry, no, yes. <laughs> no. Make sure. Okay. Sorry. I'm like watching his lips. <laughs> I think it's a no. Like, no, yes. we're cool. Okay, we, good. We got, Excellent. We got the expanding Ooh. universe. Thing. Okay, great. Uh, let's go to London, see if we, oh, this, this one I can handle. Uh, I can understand the question. Uh, let's go to London. I think we're at the, uh, we have a fan who's in front of the National Geographic Channel offices uh, in London, England. Hi, this is Danny from London. Uh, my question is, what is your favorite fact about the universe? Let's, let's start with Jason. <laughs> my favorite well, fact about the universe. I Thank you for that. Working on Throw process, me the easy one. Working as con cosmos uh, must, have, must have exposed you, know, you to a lot of new facts. You know, I, I've learned so much on this, and the one thing I've learned is that... Just work the queen into that somehow, and you'll be fine. <laughs> I, this has an, been an adventure, and that science is not a, uh, a, a, an experience of, of, of book learning, it's an adventure. And, and Cosmos has been this, you know, there's so many great stories that haven't been told, that when you hear them are about our human experience, and they relate it to me on a very, you know, emotional level. I was surprised all along the way on how much I was moved by the stories, whether they were past scientists or whether they're truths about this universe that we live in. So I don't have a favorite fact about the universe, but I can say that I, I, I have been exposed to something by the experience of working on Cosmos that I think has changed me and made me a deeper person. And, uh, and just, um, I think they're great stories here and, and I'm excited about. And Brandon, you have such an impressive body of work dealing with science, you know, science fiction. And this obviously is more science fact. Is, is there a favorite fact about the universe that, that comes to mind? That is an impossible question to answer. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Brandon. Uh, <laughs> I'm still mulling over the time travel answer. Uh, about favorite fact about the universe. Um, my favorite n new idea is the idea of the, the multiverse, which is mm. touched upon briefly in episode one, um, that there's an, maybe an alternate me that's happy uh, <laughs> out there. Um, <laughs> And uh, that's 500 visual effect shots from now. <laughs> but uh, 
But the multiverse concept, which Neil is relatively new, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. is really cool. And I think, I really hope, you know, a commonly asked question I've been getting uh, is why Cosmos, why now? And I'm like, when is it not a good time for Cosmos? And I really hope another 30 years does not go by before there's another one. I offer a little different spin on the uh, fellow's question. What, what, what attracts me most to what we've been able to achieve here is the heroes, the stories we tell. I grew up in a generation where I had uh, astronauts as heroes and they were at the uh, nexus of ambition and challenge and the forefront, the frontier, technology, engineering, and the power of, of men and women to do uh, things beyond what they, they, they thought they could do. And yet our kids today don't have those kinds of heroes. Um, uh, they've got a few. They got Neil, and, and then they got the Kardashians. <laughs> so so our, our hope here is that in every episode, as, as you saw here with Bruno, in all the subsequent episodes, um, you know, Anne and, and Brandon and, and the others involved in creating the stories that we tell, tell about the heroes through the history of, of time that are important to give role models to our kids to see what was at risk and, and, the, and the fights that they had to take on, the stakes that, that, that they were up against, uh, the wisdom that they had to uh, con confront, and that ultimately they, they helped to progress our civilization, and that these people may be inspiring as a, and, and, and take our kids t uh, uh, further in their own lives. It's wonderful. May I say my favorite fact about the universe? The thing that uh, really keeps me up at night is that it was once this big. <laughs> That's the thing that really, really fascinates me. It's amazing. So, I, you know, it, it's, it's kind of plays into your, to your answer. I, the, the more I watch this first episode, which I've seen about 15 times now, um, is the, the more I kind of am, am struck by the fact that, particularly watching the cosmic calendar sequence, is that what, what seems like such a vast amount of time the more I watch it, it starts to seem like a smaller and smaller amount of time, particularly in presented in terms of the cosmic calendar. It, it, when you think about it, it just wasn't that long ago <laughs> that the universe was, was, what is it, infinitely small. And uh, by the way, correct me at any point. Because <laughs> I have a degree in painting. Um, <laughs> but, and, and, and what, what that, What's interesting to me about that is that we, you know, we think of ourselves as, okay, here's evolution and then here's us at the end. But we're really not at the end. We're, we're the guy holding the crude right. tool halfway up the line. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, I wonder, you know, what, what will our descendants, how many billions of years from now, think of us? And, and, and you know, will we be viewed as the... Uh, Tiktaalik crawling out of the, uh, yep. the ooze. Yeah. So interesting. Yes. Neil. Oh, uh, well, I'm actually online already mm -hmm. commenting on what I think is the most astonishing fact about the universe. It's, it's the first YouTube video that ever went viral for me, but I didn't make the video. Some uh, videographer with too much time on his hands converted an answer I gave to Time Magazine into a video. So it relates to our, the fact that we are derived from stars, mm. okay? Mm. And we, we mm -hmm. displayed that in episode one. But I'd like to add one to that. Uh, what we've come to learn over time is that the universe really doesn't make anything in ones. To think that Earth is special and alone, no, we're one of multiple planets. The sun, no, sun is one of billions of other suns. Our galaxy, not one of 100 billion galaxies. Our universe, maybe we're one <laughs> in a multiverse. And if you follow this reasoning, perhaps the, uni the multiverse is just one of many. You just blew my fucking mind. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> we could be just in one multiverse. You have a seven second delay. <laughs> <laughs> among many multiverses. And so, and our brain evolved off the Serengeti. Nobody kill themselves right now, okay? <laughs> Please. So just got to stay open to that possibility. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> OK, we're going to bring it down to Earth. <laughs> this is actually one that I saw when I was backstage that I thought was, I, I just thought was 
I knew we were going to be dealing with a lot of heady questions, and I, and I thought it would be good to have one that was really about the scope of this specific production. Uh, it was, I just saw this tweet. It was a guy called uh, Just That Guy. And the question was, <laughs> how many locations were visited and how many people were involved in the production? Oh, I guess Dean Goodwin. A zillion, but somebody has the accurate number. So we, uh, we're, we've been shooting all over the world uh, since uh, last January approximately seven days, uh, dozens of countries. Um, I think, you know, more importantly, though, uh, we, we visited places that were important for the stories that they told that gave a, a, a spread throughout the world because we want a worldwide audience and that, that typified the kind of uh, geography and geology that figures into the science that we tell. And in terms of people, um, nearly 1,000 people have worked on the series, 750 directly with our team here um, and another 250 or so with a dozen special effects houses around the world. And um, so uh, as, as a, as a uh, fellow named Fred Friendly one wrote, once wrote, uh, television is the 1,000 pound pencil, meaning you got to really hold that thing really carefully with all the people who get to touch the product. And with 1,000 people involved, really the, the fact that we've come up with something that is uh, hopefully you'll find um, cohesive and uh, engaging and impressive is, is, is Anne's focus here to keep these thousand people along a singular vision for the show that we've created. But you can tell that it's so, it's so impressive. You can tell it's a passion project for everyone who is working on it. And it's, it's been the same also on the, the Fox and Nat Geo side as well. I think inspired by the work that, that you all have done has really led us, I think, to understand it in, in a new way and to try to make it be as, as successful as possible so many people around the world can see it as possible. Um, let's go to Detroit's Cranbrook, Cranbrook Institute of Science. I think there's a question for Seth. Hi, I'm Kyle McGrath. I'm from Detroit, Michigan. My question is for Seth McFarland. What was your vision for animating some of the sequences in the new series? Well. Uh, this is really a question for Caravallo, but I will answer it as best I can. It, uh, you know, we we wanted to strike a balance between um, uh, animation-wise uh, between a look that was mm. narrative-based, that was something that was accessible, but at the same time felt different from what you normally see in primetime animation, and um, and that and that was a challenge. You know, it couldn't be. An art film, but at the same time, it couldn't be Disney. So it, it had to be something that was was very specific and very unique to this series. And Kara and her team really are the ones who who deserve the credit for for putting this together and and for coming up with that style because it really it really is a a, a challenge. I mean, in in the original Cosmos, um, it was it was all shot in live action. And those are great sequences. These historical scientific, the, the, the history of science. These sequences were were compelling, um, but at the same time, you run into the problem that if you're shooting in live action, you have limitations with sets, with locations, with how much you can do. And in 2014, we thought, well, we have to expand it in some way for a, for today's audience and animation and and the richness. The life that it that it that it is capable of bringing uh, to these sequences seemed like the right way to go, and and so it it, it it was a balance between the narrative and the artistic, and and hopefully we've struck a Goldilocks zone. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like most about the animation is there's photorealistic texture mapping mm -hmm. onto the surrounding scenes, the 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 cobblestone or the. The, the the walls banner. of the yeah the banners the, the 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 sky the trees and so this has a, this it gives it just a different feel like you said it's not Disney and it's not something we, you've otherwise we talked heard. about with Kara bringing real physics into that whether it's fire or the or, or any of those kind of things and the way the light and that that seems to be something that makes it a little more accessible and feel like part of Cosmos one of my favorite moments of this episode is when Bruno is waiting to be executed and he imagines that the cell walls fall away and he floats one last time in his mind through the universe. I, I don't think you can do that effectively if it's not animated. Yeah. I don't think you would have done that with live action and mm -hmm. had it look anything like it was like the flying nun or something. <laughs> uh, but that's what, that's 
I think really those magical moments could only have happened. And, and directorially, we, whether it's live, Neil, on location versus on, on green screen versus the visual effects that you knew were coming or the animation, was, was that a challenge to cover such a huge range in one program? Was it exciting? Well, as Mitch mentioned, a lot of people worked on this show. And we shot for, just a correction, 70 days, not seven just to, to make the records. <laughs> it, 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 it felt like seven days, I got uh, <laughs> uh, time. But um, it was, it's what this, what one of the great things about this cosmos is it uses a wide range of visual, it has a, a, a large visual palette to bring Anne's scripts to life that involved a lot of people doing different things and, you know, thousands of visual effects shots. You know, we could go to the Grand Canyon, we could go to Iceland. We can't go to the edge of the universe, um, so we had to we had to create obviously a lot of this, and it's pretty. It looks pretty damn good. And what I enjoyed most was I don't do this all the time, you know. And so in in the ship of the imagination, where it's all green screen, obviously, but I'm I'm conjuring where we're supposed to be in the universe at the time, and, and Bill Pope is telling, Bill Pope, our director of photography, uh, he said, well, we're, we're and, and also a series director. So as we descend to the sun, you know, and I can feel the sun, because I know the sun, <laughs> and I know how hot it is, so I'm doing it. He said, no, Neil, you have to look a little more to the left. <laughs> so, so it was, it was uh, Bill Pope, who directed the Matrix trilogy, knows to do interesting things with the camera. And one, uh, one of the great uh, joys of this project was knowing that the camera and what the camera is doing for us is itself a character, mm -hmm. a participant in the storytelling. And you only get that when you, when you tap the talents of people who had previously used this formidable, uh, uh, this formidable uh, experience in, for, for first run films. Previously using this for, to tell the stories of dramas now we tell the story of the universe. And I, I feel privileged just to be around people who have had that depth of experience. Yeah, the, and there are more than 1,500 VFX shots in Cosmos. And in the beginning, uh, various <coughs> excuse me, VFX supervisors were telling us, it's impossible. You should quit now. You can't do this. <laughs> do you remember? They were saying it was possible. And we were lucky enough to get Reiner Gombos to be our supervisor. And and we have sat, you know, day after day looking at the glorious, beautiful ways in which Reiner and his team and the vendors have been able to simulate the glory of nature. And it has, it's just a thrill. Um, and, you know, to have all of these different uh, uh, color, uh, crayons, to, to draw the picture of Cosmos with, to have um, the animation, the VFX, Neil's brilliant performance, his great personality, um, all of these elements. I, oh, I do. <laughs> so it's I all do. state of the art. I mean, it yeah. really is all exceptional. And I, and I do think that the mixing of the, the different types of media is what also propels sort of an energy through it while you're watching it because you just keep moving and we, Neil takes us in and, and having been lucky enough to see some of the animation when it was rougher, it is now, you cannot tell the difference between the live nature photography and what you have created on a micro level. And I think that really for the viewer is gonna keep them moving right through the episodes, which, which is, you know, so entertaining and, and, and exciting. Um, okay, let's go to, uh, internationally, we're going to travel to Singapore to the Art Science Museum at the Marina Bay Sands in Singapore. I think this is for Neil. Hi, my name is Ben, and my question for Dr. Tyson would be, your film Cosmos Around the Globe. Which was your favorite city and why? Uh, great question. So my favorite location, just because it was mind blowing to me, was Iceland. I, first, the country is misnamed. It should be called Volcano Land, okay? Because it is, it, it, that, it's like the 
it's like Iceland was made yesterday, all right? There's, there's steam, right, gurgling soils and, and places where plant life has yet to recover and it's just volcanic and, and, and so we, we, every place, it was like Earth before life, we had that shot, okay? <laughs> Another planet that just got slammed and is still, we had that shot. You know, it was, it was a stand-in for so many exotic places in the solar system and I just had no idea that such a place existed on this planet. And it's right there in Iceland. And, and we, the hosts were, were, were delightful and they were friendly. And we had a little bit of midnight sun going on there. So uh, at the end of the day, people partied into the night. And it was just <laughs> a very friendly, uh, otherworldly country on our own world. Excellent, yeah. excellent. That, you're getting applause. Yeah, that's, like, oh, no. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, okay, we're gonna go to Twitter, and I guess, uh, let's see, first of all, it is, they're saying, looking forward to seeing your new series. It's from at idea to go uh, and it's a tweet, so it's, it's a little bit truncated. Sagan's intro, in, Sagan's intro mentions atoms as massive as stars. Is it true? Can you explain? I believe uh, I believe Mr. Sagan actually said atoms as massive as suns, right. but the tweet is, yeah. are there atoms as massive as stars? Is it true? Well, no, I thought I said that, actually. Oh. Yeah. But well, it wouldn't well, matter. It's a but double I'm, correction. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, I mean, in the universe, in our lives, we have such a limited range of cosmic life experience. Uh, the temperature range in which we experience and live, the range of density, the range of, uh, just think about how restrict, restricted our lives are compared to what is possible to experience in the universe. From the temperatures at the center of the sun, to the densities and temperatures at the beginning of the universe, to the density at the singularity in the center of a black hole. So when we talk about atoms as dense as, as, massive. as massive as suns, you could, there was a point where you had the mass of a sun in the volume of an atom. We had the mass of the universe in the volume of an atom. And it's, it's, like I said, it, this stuff sounds crazy, but our senses are not useful right. to decode phenomena in the universe that did not arise in the life experience of our species. Our biological senses are good for knowing when you're about to be eaten by a tiger, right? <laughs> you run, you, it's this big, but we don't see bacteria. So we are susceptible to disease in ways that you are less susceptible to tigers. And so, so just think about that. So, and we don't always look up and that's where the asteroid comes from. So, so, uh, so yes, the universe is full of extraordinary extremes of what our senses can only imagine or what our brilliant visualizers can help our senses uh, capture. So that's a yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're gonna go to Chicago's Adler Planetarium, my hometown. I think we have one for Seth here and it's a, it's a very interesting question. Hi, my name is Jake McCriskey. I'm downtown Chicago at the Adler Planetarium. Uh, this question is for Seth McFarlane. Uh, how did you meet Andrew? And how long have you been collaborating with her on the Cosmos project? You touched on it a little bit earlier, but yeah, Anne and I fought in Korea together. Um, <laughs> she won. <laughs> she won. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I I met Anne through Neil. Actually, I I, I uh, had lunch with Neil in New York. And uh, this was how I found out that Cosmos was being uh, updated and rebooted. And, uh, and I, w I was very, very excited to meet Anne because I had read her work and Carl's work throughout my entire life. And I, I remember being at that, that uh, was a crustacean, that restaurant yes, in Beverly Hills. Right. And it was so damn loud and I was so angry at everybody because I couldn't hear what Anne was saying, <laughs> because the whole place was so damn loud. I was, like, I was just hanging. Uh, yes, yeah. I was. That's what I do. I nod like I know what's going on. And and uh, and it was it was truly one of the greatest thrills of my life to 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 meet Pretty to meet Anne because me I'd I'd been an admirer for years and years. And 
and and that was you know that that was the 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 confirmation of my involvement in in this in this project and and uh, and how and long ago? And four years ago oh, was it four, four years, years? Yeah. yeah wow it's gone really quickly wow and the amazing thing was we were in Hollywood and Seth was making all these promises and they were extremely <laughs> extravagant and I had been warned about this and uh, and he kept every one of them and. <laughs> Okay, here is a question from Facebook fan Darren Matisco. Uh, it's, it's for the whole panel. If given the chance to leave Earth for another world that has intelligent life on it, but you could never return or communicate with Earth again, <laughs> would you go? <laughs> I, won't even, I won't even drive to Culver City. <laughs> <laughs> Another Boy, world that's intelligent life, but you can never return or communicate with Earth. Would you go? I'd have to know a little more about where I'm going. That's all you know. <laughs> There's intelligent life there. It sounds like a no. I would. I would. Uh, I. I'd love my existence here. I don't is know it, that I would change it. Is it just beer and wine, or is there like? Yeah. A is it, <laughs> will there be meals served on the flight? <laughs> is there anyone no. who would go? Or would everyone everyone choose to I'd stay go. on Earth? You'd go? I'd take the gamble. You, you, there really? he goes. You go? Are you that unhappy? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we need to find a southern brand and immediately. I, anywhere but here. Anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go then to San Francisco at the Morrison Planetarium at the California Academy of Sciences. I think it's another question for Neil. Hi, my name is Annie from San Francisco, and my question for Dr. Tyson is, what are some of your hobbies outside of science? Oh, uh, hobbies. I, I, though I had very little occasion to do so the last year that we've been filming, <laughs> I, I love playing with my kids if I, as I can and going on play dates with my wife. Uh, we, go to, uh, we go to theater often, uh, musical theater if available. This, they don't rotate as quickly as <laughs> dramatic theater does. Um, I like reading... <laughs> Uh, antiquarian science books, which puts my any modern thought in a context of how much of it you should you should treat mm. skeptically or with confidence when you see people speaking with confidence hundreds of years ago about things you would later learn to be yeah, completely wrong. You're, you're, you're a pretty skilled dancer. Yeah, though, but the Latin ball yeah, let's, let's, wait, 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 I am distinguishing what are current hobbies. hobbies from stuff I used to do. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. And you were also a pretty damn good wrestler, right? In my day. <laughs> that, what about day. that dancing video that's this on YouTube? Yeah, it's a little, it's you a, also know more than anyone in the world about wine. <laughs> I like wine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I like, uh, I like drinking wine that's slightly more expensive than it should be. Um, and you, you created Two Broke Girls, I think, did you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I like tasting a wine and honoring the, the wine-making efforts of, of the, the grape growers and the, the, the vinifiers. Uh, wine has been with us forever. One of my favorite quotes from Galileo is, uh, I will get it wrong, but the sense of it is right. Do you want any of that? Oh, oh thank you. <laughs> my, uh, <laughs> uh, Galileo said that the sun can hold all the planets in their appointed orbits without fail, yet manage to ripen a bunch of grapes mm -hmm. as though it had nothing else in the world mm -hmm. to do. That's beautiful. Galileo. There you go. <laughs> Okay, uh, this is exciting. We're going to go to Orlando's Kennedy Space Center <laughs> for a question, I think, for Anne. Hi, I'm Chris. I'm at the Kennedy Space Center. Do you think humans inhabited Mars and then came to Earth when Mars became uninhabitable? No. <laughs> <laughs> what is he doing, Kennedy Space Center? I know. think he was listening to Galileo and maybe having some wine. Wow. No, no, but there is, uh, you know, well, as long there's as he's something. 
Ay, ah. Ay, ah. I think what he might be thinking is of the Martian um, micro meteorites, and there might be some. He's not completely. I mean, I know I don't think humans, you know, migrated from Mars. Not at all. But but the possibility that early life came from elsewhere in the solar system in its you know its most inchoate un state is is a very is a totally uh, as we even say po in the show, a possibility it's the thing we don't right. still yet know yeah it's yeah. Uh, we learned that when an asteroid strikes <laughs> <laughs> we, we learned that when an asteroid strikes it can send a sort of reverse shock wave back up and cast rocks into space right. rocks that may that can have life as stowaways in the nooks and crannies. Mm -hmm. And here's the part that, where, where you cue the Twilight Zone music. You, we have life on Earth. By the way, space is dry, cold, and radiation intensive. We have life forms on Earth that are resistant to radiation on a scale that Earth does not need you to be resistant mm -hmm. to. We have life forms on Earth that survive extreme conditions that they don't have to survive. Why do they have these properties? And it has been suggested that life on Earth may have germinated on Mars, gotten thrust across space, through interplanetary space, landed on Earth, seeding life on Earth with life forms that include those that are radiation resistant, as well as life that you can freeze dry Reliquify and have them come back to life. That's amazing. So, it is not a completely crazy idea that life on Earth came here from Mars, making all of us descendants of Martians. If you want to think about exactly. it that way. And one last point about. I'm sorry. Sorry. One last point about that. If you we, have everybody, keep going. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, 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 no. Now you forgot your last. No, point. That's what happens. I'll come back to it. Go. No, on. no, 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 no. You're, we're, 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 like, I'm like, I don't care. I'm, <laughs> keep going. All right, all right, all right. So, so, what's interesting is what we don't know on Earth is whether there were two genesis, oh. gen, gen, genocide on Earth, because all life on Earth that we have tested has common DNA which points to a common origin. If we go to Mars and find evidence of life, either there now or past life, and it has DNA, we test the DNA, and we might be able to find the earliest branch point of, the, of, of, of biology on Earth starting on Mars. Now, if you can, now, all right, so now, if we find life and it has no DNA, that's more interesting because it meant its identity was encoded in a way that had nothing to do with anything we understand life to be. Mm. And that would be cool. But now, uh, one last thing. Here's, I, I, ready? ready? Okay, watch, watch, watch this. Ready? Okay, so if rocks can hit and thrust other rocks into space, which they do, and they land on other planets, we know the surface of the moon has been pristine. Yes, it gets slammed, but nothing gets eroded. There's no weather, there's no earthquake, moon quakes, nothing. If you, if you land there, you are there. It has been suggested that maybe the impact that took out the dinosaurs 65 million years ago cast earth rocks into space that landed on the moon. And if you search the moon for rocks from earth, they may contain fossil evidence that goes all the way back to the beginning of life on earth getting us evidence of life farther back in time than we could possibly recover from Earth itself. Incredible. I was able to follow all of that, and I'm very, very pleased. Uh, I do want to make sure before we run out of time, though, that we take a question from Los Angeles. So I think we do have someone here. Hi, what's Hi. your name? My name is Dawn, and I'm from Hi, Orlando. Good name to have. Dawn, All beautiful right. name. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Um, no one's named Dusk. No. I don't know why. <laughs> I've never met one. <laughs> if I could pick up 500 pounds here on Earth, how much could I pick up on Mars? Ooh, 
But it's a math question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, uh, oh, okay. So, but if you can pick up 500 pounds here on Earth, you belong in the Olympics, okay? <laughs> let's, let's start there, okay? Um, Mars has 38% of Earth's gravity. So 500 pounds would be 38% of what you could pick up. So if I do the math on that, uh, it would be something like 1,200 pounds, 1,300 pounds around there. And so you'd be even more awesome there. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Perfect, thank you. Okay, Thanks, Don. Good. Jill? If I can, just before we run out of time. You have a different answer? No, I want to. Neil, I know, I know. Neil, like. Neil, Neil, Neil gets this stuff from me. Yeah. <laughs> and before we run out of time, we wanted to thank a couple of constituencies in particular. Um, it was Anne's and my notion that we include all the planetaria around the world that are joining us today and the affiliates uh, internationally because it was important to us to really give you all a preview of this series. And we appreciate that you've all um, embraced this and that it's been supported by our, our sponsors. And second of all, as one of the senior executives told us at the outset at Fox, when, when Fox and National Geographic get behind you, watch out. Um, they really have uh, across the board. There are many champions here, including uh, Peter Rice and Kevin Riley and David Lyle and Howard Owens and Alan Butler and many, many others who have uh, paved the way for us that, that Seth began, and uh, we're, we're, we're in their gratitude forever for the, the, the kind of opportunity they've given to Ann and all of us uh, to produce this series of our dreams. I'd like to add, yes, excellent. I'd like to add that for urban residents, for so many of us as I was, our first encounter with the night sky is your city's planetarium. And so it's, it's, it's just, I, I, I feel very warmed knowing that we have some of the major planetariums out there uh, joining us. Uh, people in Chicago and Los Angeles and, and New York, uh, uh, St. Louis, uh, places where that's, where that's that's your ticket to the universe. And so I just wanna just give a shout out to the planetariums out there. I, of course, I represent the Hayden in New York, uh, but basically it's, uh, not many other sciences do you have those kinds of conduits to the frontier. You'll also be very happy to know that um, every one of our theaters was uh, sold out tonight. We had people in New York uh, in 20 degree weather wow. waiting for, for several hours. Uh, it's not that, 20 degrees is not really. Cold in New York. Well, yeah. just, it <laughs> rained here the other day. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. not impressed. Did, did you have yeah, closing thoughts? I just thoughts? wanted to say that uh, you know the original Cosmos series uh, was written by Carl Sagan and Steven Soder and me. And when I began wanting to do another uh, Cosmos, I turned first to Steve Soder, and we wrote the original drafts of most of the episodes uh, together. Unfortunately, he had to depart uh, a couple of years ago, but I treasure those endless seven-day weeks with him, uh, just imagining what the new cosmos could be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. for joining us uh, across the country and around the world. Unfortunately, that is all the time that we have. Oh, one more shout out, real one quick. One more. Uh, we're, we're, we're about to retire to the Griffith Observatory and Planetarium. I just want to give a shout out to Ed Krupp, who is, like, is going to let us run all over his place <laughs> this evening. And so uh, just, again, it's the, it's, the, it's the group participation trying to make this work for us all. So Ed Krupp, uh, thanks for giving and us the run of your been, house. There's already been drinking, so Ed's getting <laughs> a little bit. But so, Joe. just a reminder that Cosmos, a space-time odyssey, premieres this Sunday. I cannot believe it. What an amazing know, journey. Huh? And it's coming this Sunday, March 9th, uh, 9, 8 central, simultaneously on 10 Fox Networks group channels in the U.S., including Fox and the National Geographic Channel. And the series will also air around the world on 220 channels in 181 countries with an overall footprint of more than a half billion homes. Say billion. Billion. And if I can, I just, wanna, I, I just want to shout out to everybody who's worked on this show so tires, tirelessly, certainly over the last 15 months. And I know we have a little more time to go. And I want to thank everybody. We've had incredible artists inspired by the original Cosmos, by Anne's words, 
by the dedication of this team here and the countless other people who put all those hours into it. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone for joining us online, everyone here in Los Angeles, and to those who submitted questions from all over the world. A big, big thank you to our sponsors, Samsung Galaxy and Chrysler Brand for making it all possible and for their support of Cosmos. Finally, please help me thank our amazing panelists for being with us tonight. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you.